Okay? So, assuming today you have sodium chloride case, you have V plus equals to 1, V minus equals to 1. What is your V? Okay, so the definition of V is going to be equal to V plus plus V minus, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your V if you, have, if you have this case? Your V plus is 1, V minus is 1. 2. 2, right? Why is your M plus minus? So your M plus minus is calculated through this equation, right? So basically, it's your m plus raised to the v plus power times m minus uh, raised to the v minus power, and then you divide by the uh, you take one over v. Okay. So assuming you have m not solution in the beginning, okay. Assume we have one m not solution in the beginning. Then you know your m plus is going to equals to just M not, right? Because it's one to one ratio. So you know your M plus is M not. V plus is just one, right? Times your M minus will be also equal to your M not. And the V minus is also equal to one. And this whole term need to get the square root. Okay, and this is your m plus minus. Okay, so once you do this, you know you're going to have m squared, then you take the square root of that, that gives you just m, right? Or m not here. So you know if you have 1, 1, v equals 2, your m plus minus is just equals to your m not. Alright? And for your sodium chloride case, your Z plus is actually plus 1. Your Z minus is negative 1. Okay? And then you need to calculate your I. Okay? I is going to be equal to 1 half, let's say your M plus times your Z plus square plus your M minus times your Z minus square. Okay, so in this case, your m plus is m not. Your z plus square is one square. Okay, plus m minus is also m not. Your z minus is also one square. Okay, so this is two m not divided by two. So your i is equals to also m not in this case. Okay, everybody follow. <coughs> this is the simplest case you can have. All right. So now we're going to talk about another case. So this, give you an example. This is sodium chloride. Okay. So use sodium chloride as an example. And let's talk about the A two S O four. Ready? Why is your V plus? Hmm? V plus should be 2, right? V minus should be 1. Total V will be 3. What's your M plus minus? So your m plus minus will be. So your m plus now have a concentration of two m not right. Two m not raised to the v plus power, which is two times 
your m minus concentration will be just m naught raised to the first power. Okay, and this whole thing into the cube root of that, right? So this is your m plus minus for this case. Okay, so you could have four m naught this. So it's going to give you Okay, so it's this. Clear? You need to know this. Okay, if you don't understand, tell me now. Okay, so why is your Z plus? One, right? What's your Z minus? Two. What's your I? So we know I is equals to I is equals to one half. Let's say the M plus times Z plus square plus M minus times Z minus square, right? So it's one half. What's your M plus? Is two M not? What's your Z plus? Is one raised to the first power. Okay. Your M minus will be just M naught, and your Z minus will be two square. Okay. So what you're going to have is. 1 half, this is 2 and not, this is 4 and not, so you have 6 and not, so this will eventually give you 3 and not concentration. Alright? Everybody clear? So if today I give you a random salt, can you write this and this by yourself? Okay, you should be able to do it now, okay? And make sure you have these type of questions in your homework as well. So this is how you calculate your M plus minus in the ionic strength. Okay? So there's one more thing you need to remember for your ionic strength is actually the, if you mix multiple electrolytes inside your solution. For example, if today you mix your sodium chloride and the uh, sodium sulfate into one single solution, how do you calculate the ionic strength? Okay, so that's actually very simple. You can. You can still use this equation, okay? Because you can see I just say plus and minus. I did not specifically say it's one ion, right? So as long as that's if a multiple uh, K ionics uh, exist inside your solution, then you have multiple of these terms, and then all you have to do is just sum it all up. That's your overall ionic strength for your solution, okay? So one example will be if today you mix point zero one M naught of sodium sulfate, okay, and then point zero two M naught sodium chloride. Assuming this is the concentration of these two species uh, dissolve in your final solution, okay, then you can calculate the ionic strength of sodium. You can also calculate the ionic strength of your sulfide or sulfate and the ionic strength of your chlorides. Okay? And then you add it all up. That's what be your ionic strength of your solution. Okay?
So the way you do it is actually since you know this, you know your sodium plus is going to be equals to two point zero two and not as O4 2 minus is <coughs> point zero 0.01 and not. Okay, and this sodium plus is equals point zero 0.02 and not. And then your chloride minus is equals to point zero two and not. Okay? And you know the charge for your sodium is plus one. Charge for your sulfate is minus two. For your chloride is minus one. Then you know how to calculate each individual term of this. Okay? And then you add and go up. And then you get your final ionic strength. So if you calculate this way, your I is going to be equals to 0 0.05. Okay? <coughs> so that's one way to solve this. The other way to solve this is you have this table already. Okay? So you know if you have one and not of sodium chloride your ionic strength will be just N naught. Okay? If the one N of sodium sulfate, your ionic strength will be C N naught. Right? So, you know, the ionic strength you're coming from your sodium chloride is going to be equal to 0 0.02 N naught. Right? Based on this relationship. And for this guy, you know your ionic strength from your sodium sulfate is going to be equal to 3 times of your original concentration, right? Which is 0 0.03 M0. Okay, so you know your total ionic strength of your solution will be just equal to the sum of these two. And that gives you 0 0.05 M0 as well. Okay, so if you have this table and you just do this estimation, you can notice, you know this, then you just add it all up, then you get the answer. Okay, so for your, this is pretty much all you need to do for your ideal solution, right? Because we calculate how the M plus minus the mean ionic molarity is related to your original concentration. Right, and the gamma equals to one. Then you know how to write the A for your ideal solution. Right, but for your non-ideal solution, there's one more thing to deal with, which is your gamma plus minus. Questions? All right. So uh, let's talk about how you can actually get a gamma. Okay. So in order to get your gamma, the that's one very important theory you need to know. Okay, if you go to page number eight, you will see this theory called the Debye Hilco theory. Okay. Okay, the Debye Hilco theory is actually a very sophisticated theory. Okay. The concept is actually very simple though. So how you say it's actually assuming today have electrolyte. Okay. All these electrolytes you have uh, in, in, the, in your electrolyte uh, solution you have uh, K ion and N ion. Okay. So if they are dilute or not, okay, so that's the first assumption. If they are dilute or not. Okay, then you're going to have, consider, okay, you just have positive ion and negative ion randomly distributed inside the space, right? But it's not randomly distributed because you know uh, there's a force between your positive and negative ions, right? So if today you have, you focus on one positive ions here, then you know the species that surrounded it will be negative charge, right? It cannot be positive charge, so you know 
this will be most likely the case. Okay. I think I draw it too close. It will be actually a certain distance away from this. Okay. So the reason there's a some separation distance between the positive and negative charge is because is he he is going to attract a lot of negative ions. Okay, but once this negative ion was brought to this position, they start to feel each other. Okay, so they cannot bring to too close because these two don't doesn't like each other. You know? They repulse each other. Therefore, the distance between your positive ion and negative ion, there's a certain distance. Let's call it A. Okay, you will basically eventually form kind of like a circle or sphere around this positive charge. Okay? And then that's pretty much your first layer. Okay, once you have these all these negative ions, they're going to attract the positive ion as well, right? So you know uh, outside this you have some more other positive ions. Okay. So you can think about this, if you have multiple positive and negative ions inside, it's going to form like layer by layer structures, okay? Center is positive and negative and positive and negative alternative up here. Okay, so that's the basic model for the particle theory. Okay? Okay, so you also know from your general physics, okay, you know the force between two point charge, okay, is going to equal to Q1 times Q2 divided by 4 pi epsilon gamma 1, 2 square E this. Okay, so the Q is actually the charge uh, you can have for two separated uh, charge species, okay? And the distance between there is actually the R, okay? And this epsilon just the um, dielectric constants uh, for your system, okay? And if you cut, want to calculate your dielectric constant, is going to equal to your electro permeability times your electro permeability of the medians you have, okay? So that means if you put in the solution inside water or inside uh, ethanol solution, you are going to have different types constants, okay? And all these things will be provided like in your questions. So you don't need to worry about this, okay? So let's the force between two charged species, okay? So since Right now, inside your solution, you have so many particles that are going to arrange in certain geometry, okay? So, previously, from what, when we learned the uh, statistical thermodynamics, we say, okay, this distribution eventually is going to follow the Boltzmann distribution, okay? And the Boltzmann distribution have the functional form of Okay, so this is a functional form of Boltzmann distribution, okay? They can actually describe what is the general uh, charge species distribution exists inside your solution, okay? So what people can figure out based on this simple model is actually if you calculate the number of charge at certain distance, NJ okay, so distance is going to equals to four pi epsilon r times one plus alpha times a minus z i d squared times Exponential negative kappa gamma uh, r minus a. 
Okay, so this is the equation you have on your hangout. And what I want to see is actually inside this equation, you can consider that there's two parts. Okay, so this is the first part, and this is the second part. For the first part, it actually looks very similar to the uh, force between two point charges. Okay, so it's always you have Q squared or the charge squares on the top and your distance at the distance uh, at the bottom. Okay, so this is actually if you do the statistical uh, analysis for mass system, this is actually the force between one single point charge to a distribution of charges. Okay, so you should know the differences. This is two separated point charges. This is actually if you bring one single charges and you look at huge amount of charges, that's the force you're going to have. Okay, so this is derived from the statistical thermodynamics. Okay, and derivation is just too complicated. Like we are not going to go through all these derivations. But that's the concept. Okay, so this describes the force between one single charge to a, a group of charges inside a solution. This is actually described the distribution of those charges, which follows Boltzmann distribution. Therefore, you can see this and this is somewhat similar. Okay, so apparently this is actually a distance dependent uh, function. What it means is actually if you bring a charge from very far away from that group of charge species, and you bring them in, okay, then the force, this specific charge field from here is actually different. It's very straightforward, okay. So that's why R inside here, okay. The important thing I want you to pay attention to is actually the kappa, okay. So if you look at the hangout, kappa looks very complicated. Kappa is going to equal to E times square root of 2 N A, so it should be I forgot the number. I think I forgot to underscript the A, okay? Times the density of your solution. Times your I is the ionic strength of your solution. Okay. Divide by dielectric constant times your Boltzmann constant times the temperature. So even though it looks very complicated, but most of them they are just constants. Okay, for example, this is KB is your Boltzmann constant. T is just temperature. Okay, Na just your Avogadro number. Though just the density of your solution. Okay, and this is just the electric constant. of your solution. Okay? Which can be easily obtained from the table you have, okay? And this will be easily obtained from the property of your solvents. Okay, so to calculate this one is actually very simple. Okay, because all these things is <coughs> nothing is very easy to obtain. Okay? <coughs> you can rewrite this whole thing as beta times Square root of your I strength. Okay, so beta is basically every charge inside here without your I. Okay, so it's just a, for a given solvent, it will be also a constant too. So you know the kappa is going to directly related to your ionic strength. Okay, and kappa actually has a very specific name, it's called the, the by length. So what does that mean uh, physically? Okay, so if you go to your page number nine, you will see a plot on the left. Okay, so what I plot do is actually if you plot out the uh, 
the uh, service charge versus distance r. Okay, so what does this mean? The service charge means um, in your bicycle theory, now you can see your charge distribution, even though I draw in 2D, inside your solution is actually a 3D distribution, okay? So positive in the center, then you're going to surround it by the positive, uh, negative ions, and then another layer of positive ions, and then another layer of negative ions, okay? You can see as this goes out, you're going to have multiple layers, right? So. If you count how many charges you have at a given distance, okay, so basically you need to consider the whole sphere surface, not just a single distance R, okay, it's actually a sphere distance, and you count how many uh, charges you have on that sphere, okay, and then you plot against the distance R from the center, okay, so this is your center, so this is your zero point, and that's your R, okay. If you plot it out, actually you'll find out the number of charges you have has some distributions, and it looks like this. Okay? Here is actually your A. Okay, so this is called the excluded volume. Okay, and the A is called the excluded radius. That means within the distance of A, you cannot find any charges. All right? And then you will see, okay, then you start to count the charges you have. For example, if you count the charge at this point, then you know this, 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 this. Okay? And then in the whole sphere, when you take it into account, you get certain values. Okay? And then you keep doing that, if you expand the surface layer a little bit more, so if you go to here, then all this need to be, all these species on this layer will be counted. Okay? So you will see the increase of the charge species as a piece of R. Okay? And then eventually you're going to hit a maximum. Okay? And then it's going to start with decreases. Okay? And then this is the the balance. Okay? Which is going to be equal to one over kappa. So, how do you actually estimate this? If you look at the y-axis uh, carefully, you can see it's actually 4 pi r squared times your nj. Right? This is 4 pi r times your nj. That means you're actually uh, counting the, all the charges within that surface, not just a, a given distance r, okay? It's actually a surface, okay? So, in order to get this maximum, what do you do? You actually do the derivative of this guy with respect to R, right? Then make this one equal to zero, then you're going to get this. Okay? So if you look at your n if you look at your four pi r squared times your nj, where well, nj is equal to At the, at the top, just you know, a few constants, right? At the bottom, you see in the first time you have r minus a, and then you times kappa exponential negative kappa uh, minus a. Okay, so only these two terms is related to your r, right? So if you do this four pi r squared times your nj, then you know eventually what you're going to have is equals to r times exponential negative kappa times r minus a. Okay, so this effectively 
this is what this means, right? If you do the the relative respect to R, then basically what you're going to do is doing this respect to R, okay? So once you do this, you know there are two terms, right? So you do the first term derivative, then you get exponential negative kappa uh, minus k, okay? And then if you do the derivative for the second term, it will equal to r times exponential still remain the same, okay? Then you do a derivative of that, that gives you negative kappa, okay? So. And you know this whole thing needs to be equals to zero. All it means is R times your negative kappa has to be equals to negative one, so these two terms can cancel out. Okay? Therefore your R is going to be equals to just one over kappa. Okay? So this is why if one over kappa, you will see your maximum values. All right. Okay. So we know the kappa is. If you calculate the kappa of a uh, 